Listen to the 48 Hours podcast for shocking murder cases and compelling real life dramas from one of television's most watched true crime shows. Go behind the scenes of each episode with award winning CBS News correspondents and producers in Post Mortem, a weekly deep dive. Listen to 48 Hours wherever you get your podcasts. Does it take you a long time to write? It's all different. I was like teaching Madonna how to sing this one phrase and I was like, this isn't, this doesn't happen. Honestly, when we wrote it and we released it, I thought, I thought for sure I was going to be murdered. You are an artist with a mission, would you say? Yes. I've always been a really vulnerable, open person. I think that vulnerability is the key to empathy. Well, that was Mary Lambert. She is a Grammy-nominated singer and songwriter, poet, and musician. You know her, but you may not know you know her. She has had two Grammy nominations for Song of the Year for Same Love and Album of the Year for The Heist with Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, as well as the iconic performance alongside pop legend Madonna at the Grammys. And this is someone that writes from a really authentic place. And she holds nothing back. She has suffered from PTSD due to rape. She talks about it very honestly. She talks about the therapeutic techniques that she's had to use to keep it together, moving along in her life. She is an artist with a mission, and you very seldom find someone that is so transparent about where her art comes from. You're going to find her refreshing and funny. So here we go with Mary Lambert. I'm Katie Maloney, 37, a divorcee, and I'm out here falling in love every day with myself. And I'm Dana Kathan, 33, former needy mess and delusional Leo, but I've never been happier. Never been happier. You know that. Good. (laughs) The foundation of this podcast is for people who want to live their life unapologetically. It's a safe space for anyone who's going through a transition in their life or just dealing with the regular bullshit. It's a religion. We're not saying that we're looking to start a coven, but that might be why we started this podcast. not saying that. Join our cult. I mean, community. I mean, the coven. Religion. Okay, let's just stick with community. Listen to the podcast. Listen to the podcast. <laughs> well, thanks for being here. Thank you so much. I'm going to do shameless plugs throughout this whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Your book, Shame is an Ocean I Swim Across, Poems by Mary Lambert, is your current book, right? Yeah. We're going to talk about this because this is written from your heart, it's written from some pain, and it's written from some experience. This isn't something you just threw together (laughs) on the way home one day. No. (laughs) This really comes from life and pain, and so we're going to talk about this a lot today. Again, shameless plug. Shame is an Ocean I Swim Across by Mary Lambert. I'm not even pretending that I'm not trying to promote this because I am. It's moving, and it's something you should read, and I highly recommend it. So we'll talk about that as we go along. Thank you. Wow. Why do you say wow? I don't know. It was just really generous. I'm going to cry. It's just really nice of you. Well, you can cry. (laughs) I'm going to. I cry a lot. (laughs) This is a work of art, and I'm really impressed by it and impressed by your courage and a lot of the things that you do. You are an artist with a mission, would you say? Yes. Tell me who you are. Tell me about (laughs) your mission. I think I've always been a really vulnerable, open person. And I think that vulnerability is the key to empathy because when you're vulnerable, it immediately is like an invitation for another person to show you who they are as well. And I think that sort of that unlocks empathy. And I think empathy is what leads to real deep connection. And I think when we connect with each other on real tangible levels, not just I like chocolate ice cream, but on like, like on levels that, um, are, are spiritually and, and, um, with experiences make us 
um, more understanding of each other. And I think that that's what's going to save the world. I don't think we have enough of that in our current day to day. And I think it's difficult to access those things. So my mission as an artist is to um, encourage vulnerability by putting the lens on my experiences as sort of this, you know, trauma survivor and, and, you know, the laundry list of, of, mm -hmm. of experiences that I've had. Well, I think that's why your writing resonates with me because you say vulnerability breeds empathy, mm. right? That's yeah. what your belief is. And I agree completely because I believe in the principle of reciprocity. Mm -hmm. I think you get what you give. Yeah. You're exactly right about chocolate ice cream. If you pass somebody in the mall and you say, how you doing? And they say, fine. What are you going to say? Fine. Yeah. You say, fine. You? Fine. You get what you give, right? Yeah. If you pass somebody in the mall and you say, how you doing? And they go, well, you know, I've had a pretty tough week, actually, because my mom died this week. Yeah. How about you? Fine. You yeah. wouldn't say that, right? <laughs> yeah. You would. you would stop and say, oh, really? I'm sorry to hear that. I've actually been through that myself. You 100%. get what you get. If you yeah. engage superficially, you get superficial. Absolutely. You engage with anger, you get anger. You engage with vulnerability. Now somebody's going to say, well, you know what? She's going to be real with me. I'll be real with her. Right. That's what you do here. In your book, you're saying, I'm willing to show you my heart, my pain, my victories. So people read that and say, you know, if she can do that, I can do that. Right. I think that's why that resonates. I think that's why your music resonates. Thank you. Say you don't put out 90% of the songs you write. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> you say you keep them for yourself. Yeah, I think when I, when I write you music. Do that. <laughs> I just try to, I write, I'm a, I'm kind of a prolific writer and that I just, I'm constantly thinking of things or, or writing, but I, I like to be really thoughtful and intentional with what I'm putting out into the world. And right. there are some pieces of art that I think that are inadvertently harmful that, you know, within their messaging, it's just not, uh, it just doesn't seem intentional or that it's thinking about the desired outcome for the receiver. And for me, that like the receiver is the most delicate part of that sharing. So I'll, I'm going to create until I die and I'm going to cr create all the time. But I want to be really thoughtful about what I promote and what I choose to release because I, I just I, I want there to be care involved. Yeah, you, know, you don't have to put out everything. Yeah. <laughs> You've got that piece you wrote, like, why don't you all jump up my ass? Yeah, exactly. You might want to keep that one <laughs> on the shelf for a while, but other than that, I mean, some of this you might want to let out, you know? Yeah, yeah. I want to talk about your early experiences so people know where you come from, because yeah. I say that the poems that you've written, the messages that you share come from your experience some from pain, some from trauma. Mm -hmm. You were born in Washington, right, mm -hmm. Everett? Yeah. That's a pretty conservative provincial sort of town, right? It's a mix of things. I mean, it's sort of one of those um, places. Well, it ain't LA. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's funny because it's you know forty minutes from Seattle, but it is yeah. uh, at least when I was growing up, it was a, it was quite conservative. In fact, your family got kicked out of the church, right? Yeah. Why? Uh, my mom, uh, well, we initially got kicked out of the church because my mom divorced my dad. My mom divorced my dad because he was sexually abusing me. And um, and so the church, he was, he was really well respected in our church. And so they kind of just, they didn't really believe my mom and, and thought that she should just kind of stick with it. So they with, punched the victim, it. not the perpetrator. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And then when she started dating a woman, that was just the whole, <laughs> that was, that was the end. So, <laughs> that was the icing on the cake. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but it, w it was also Pentecostal. And so there was just a lot, a lot harsher, stricter social rules as well. I've always said, I love the Lord. It's Christians. I can't stand it. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. So they keep the sexual predator and kick out the mother and child. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> seems reasonable. Yeah, seems reasonable to me. And <laughs> they knew that there were allegations that he was sexually abusing you. I don't know that it was, I mean, I was like five or six at the time, so I don't know 
all that was sort of shared within the community. And I think it was just very, it was very hush hush, but I knew that we weren't welcome to go to that church anymore. Uh huh. And he was sexually abusing you? Yes. For how long? I don't know. I have, I have very little recollection. Um, but I was getting uh, yeast infections um, from when I was about two years old until I was five years old. And then when he was out of the picture, um, they stopped. So. Well, that's a pretty good measure right there. Right? Yeah. Yeah. May I say two things? Number one, I'm not going to ask you any embarrassing details about that, but I do want to say I'm very sorry that happened to you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I don't care how long it's been. I'm yeah. very sorry that happened to you. Have you gotten help with that? I've been in therapy for 25 years. <laughs> Has it been effective? Yes. Yeah. I, I recently discovered a different kind of therapy called CRM that kind of changed my life. Because mm -hmm. I... It wasn't that I, I don't have an issue talking about um, traumatic events. It's not, and it's also, I'm not like glazed over when I talk about it. It is affecting. I do, there is, a, um, I am being, you know, honest with my sort of brain patterns and what I'm feeling. Um, but I think the way that that trauma has impacted me is something that's more, more uh, spiritual and, and almost psychic and has to do with, things that even my brain can't totally control. So I wanted to try different tactics and different um, ways to um, re rewire some of that in at least ways that it seemed to affect my behavior. Mm -hmm. So I, and I remember after, so after that happened with my father, my mom, you know, started dating other abusive people and so I remember being like a seven-year-old thinking, oh God, like I, this is going to screw me up. Like I, I want to be high functioning. I have a lot I want to accomplish in life. I have to start tackling this now. So when I was about eight, I um, started reading case studies of adolescents and like with therapists because I wanted to be a therapist. And I thought if I could learn how therapists talk to kids, I could talk to myself that way. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it has always been a, a a goal of mine to make sure that I'm um, that I'm high functioning and and that I I I don't um, perpetuate any harm to the world and that I only um, I'm only like a a steward of goodness and and kindness in the world. When you started therapy, how old were you? Um, probably about five. Did it help immediately? No. <laughs> because you actually attempted suicide when you were 17. Yeah. And you had been into drugs and alcohol during that time. Was yeah. that self-medication? Absolutely. You went from 5, 12 years all the way to 17. Right. And we're still at a point that the pain was so great. Right. Your escape was to stop living. Right. I mean, there were... There were repeated additional things that happened at that time to sort of... Um, I think compound the early childhood abuse. I was gang raped when I was 16 in an army barracks. Um, and then I was sort of um, struggling with uh, being Christian and also being gay and also being um, a chubby girl and then also being bipolar. These were just like, it just felt like it, I, it was never ending. And um that there was a time where it just felt like the only way out. And now as like where I am now, I can't, I can't even fathom it. I like get a, I, I'll get a new tattoo and I'll be like, why am I doing this? This hurts. You know, I like, I really value life so much more than I ever thought I would. But I would say that I don't know that therapy for me personally was as effective from when I was like five to 17. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's just because I, my goal with the therapist was for them to like me because <laughs> I wanted everyone to like me. Right. And it was less about repairing, um, uh, you know, these, these coping mechanisms and these brain patterns that had um, resulted from trauma. Mm -hmm. But what was my survival was writing music and writing poetry and finding these outlets and, um, and performing. And so without those those conduits of um uh survival i wouldn't i wouldn't be alive for sure so you've learned coping mechanisms 
that you do use now. Yeah, absolutely. Because the comprehensive resource model that the CRM therapy, yeah. this fight, flight, this is something that you really have to work at because you have triggers that are going to either trigger a coping sequence or they're going to trigger a meltdown sequence. Mm-hmm. You've gotten to the point that this can trigger a coping sequence for right, you. Right, right. And you do that effectively now. Yes. How does that interplay with your bipolar? Do you medicate for bipolar? Yeah, yeah. Do you stay on it consistently? Yes. Does it work? Yes. Can you tell if the medicine is working overtime, you're having to struggle with it, or is it pretty stabilized for you? I still, I mean, I think it's the nature of my uh, my career and my job and what I do is just so, there's so much instability. And there was a period of time I wasn't, I was on the road for 300 days out of the year and I was, I barely was ever home or knew what, like what to call my apartment. And um, sometimes my stuff was just in storage. So that schedule and that and this sort of career doesn't really lend itself to mental stability. And I mean, going into, um, in the entertainment industry, there's so much like focus on celebrity culture and image and, um, who, you know, and so that sort of feeds into the mania as well. And, and there's, you know, there's a lot of going out and, um, and so I, I contend with that. I still struggle with that in terms of schedule and things like that. But I, um, I would say that I, I handle it a lot better than maybe I used to. Um, I think sometimes I used to use, um, my mania as sort of a scapegoat, um, not intentionally. It was just all I really knew. I just right. knew that like for a week I just wouldn't sleep or eat and I would just try to have sex with everyone. And that was just part of something I was always going to have to deal with. Um, and then I realized that I could maybe start making different pro- provisions and set up, like set my life up in a way where I was prepared for that to happen rather than kind of shaming myself about it. Um, so, well, in the CRM model, they talk to you about fight, flight, freeze. You learn these phases and what you're in. At this point, you recognize what's happening with you, right? Yeah. You know the brain pathways. You know what you're doing. Yes. You said you started out trying to read things that therapists might use to help other people. You thought it might help you. Yeah. It never works out that way. <laughs> they pulled all of these. Freshman psychology students over the years, the number one reason people get into psychology is because they're all screwed up and yep. they think, I'll get into it and then I'll figure out what's wrong. But actually what they do is they get in and read about all the disorders and then they think they have every one they read about. Yeah. And then the follow-up stage says, well, did it work? And the answer is overwhelmingly no, it didn't work. I just now think I have everything, which doesn't help. Now, you said you were gang raped at 16 in a military barrack. Mm-hmm. When you look back on that now, What do you say to yourself about that that keeps you from wanting to go kill everybody? (laughs) Yeah, I think there was a a long period of time. It was only actually recently that I didn't get really panicked when I saw someone in uniform or had or had any sort of talk about the military. Like I was just, you know, very anti-military and it wasn't it wasn't necessarily politically minded. It was just like, I have this happened to me, you know? Um, I, uh, I think rape isn't always clear for some people. And when it happened to me, I made a lot of, um, I made a whole narrative in my head so I could feel better about it. And the narrative was that I cheated on my high school boyfriend and that, um, and that, you know, and that I was a prize and that my, um, I was in an apartment with like 30 men in the army and no other women. And I was 16. And so of course what happened felt like it was going to, it happened. Um, and I think, I don't know. I think, I mean, that it took me about two years to say, okay, that I, 
I said no. I I like physically kept my body closed. I didn't want that to happen, and it did happen. And that, like, I know I verbally said no. I know I physically said no. So I have to. I need to. I need to accept to myself that I was raped, but it feels like I didn't want to be, I, I, I didn't want to take that space up because I felt like rape is like, you know, it's a, it's a man behind a bush with a knife. That's, you know, it's violent and it wasn't necessarily violent. I said no. And then I didn't, I realized I was unsafe. So I kind of had to let it happen. And so I was like, okay, I guess I'm just, this is going to happen now. And I feel like there's a lot of people who have had experiences like that where they've been coerced in some way and then finally kind of given. And um, and that just doesn't that just kind of sets you up in a really weird mental state. And I think in retrospect, I was like, oh, God, I was 16 years old. And I every time I got to the age, one of the perpetrators was that the age that one of the perpetrators was, does that make sense? So like when I was 23 and then 25 and then 27, I was like, I would never, I would never do that. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. You of course realize at 16, you don't have the capacity to give consent. Right. That's a definition of rape in and of itself. Right. You don't have the capacity to say yes. Yeah. You don't even have to go beyond that. Right to define your situation, let alone the fact that you're coerced, you're in fear. I realize at that age, it looks different, but you see it clearly now, right? Yes. Yeah. But it, t- it took a long time to like- Of course it does. To, to, to see it. Particularly if you're working that out in your own head and not talking about it with somebody that you can trust. Right. To give you a clear perspective. Right. Are you clear now? Yes. Totally clear now. Yeah, I think I it's it's hard because I have spoken about it um, previously, like in uh, with other outlets before, and I'll get I'll get some backlash, especially from like uh, people in the military that say there's no way, there's no way you could have gotten into the barracks, or like you're lying, like why are you making this story up? And that like that hurts because I just feel like defensive mm-hmm. and like well, actually it is possible, and it did happen to me, and I it it sucks to. Well, you know it's possible because it happened. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty good test of reality yeah. right there, right? Yeah. Well, it's just it's so hard to not be believed. But, you know, the test of whether it constituted rape or not is just very simply asking yourself what you would say to a 16-year-old if they were in that situation. Right. If they came and said to you, here's what happened to me yesterday afternoon or last night, what happened to me and what should I say to myself? Right. Right. You wouldn't have a bit of trouble knowing what no. to tell them. No. Then you got to be your own best friend. Absolutely. You got to talk to that 16 year old girl. I yeah. mean, so it becomes very clear when you think about what you would say to a 16 year old girl seeking your counsel. Absolutely. All of a sudden, there's some objectivity there that makes it real clear, right? Right. Yeah. And I think, I mean, um, I feel like that's where I create art. I create art from the the hope that I somehow can retroactively talk to my 17-year-old yeah. self. And you can and do because I have this theory that we should actually cultivate this continuity of ID that we're the same person today that we were when we were two or three or four or 16 or 20 or whatever in terms of not just our physical being, but all of our values, memories, victories, pains, everything. I have two boys, and I listen to oldies a lot, (laughs) and they say, Dad, your oldies are getting really old. (laughs) But it is somewhat nostalgic for me because I was homeless when I was 14 on the streets in Kansas City. I don't want to forget that part of my life. Right. I don't want to forget it. I don't want to forget the times in my life that maybe they weren't as good as other times, but they're still part of who I am. I'm still that kid that was there then that had all of the fears, challenges, things that you have to deal with at that point. That's still part of who gets up every day and goes and does what I do today. And when I look at something, it's still that 14-year-old kid looking at those things. When I achieve something, that 14-year-old kid contributes to it, 
yes. takes away from it, whatever. And I think it's important that I stay in touch with them. And that's what I call grounded. That's why I don't ever play the game of life with sweaty palms. <laughs> because I've been poor. I can do poor. Yeah. I know how to do it. Don't yeah. like it, but I know how to do it. It doesn't intimidate me, doesn't scare me. Same. You give me a good pair of sneakers and something to bounce or play ball with, I'm fine. Yeah. I can do it. And so I stay in touch with that. And so I do talk to that 14-year-old kid, just like you can still talk to that 17-year-old girl. Absolutely. And you can do it through your poems and your songs. Yeah. And when you do, you're now talking to all the girls that are currently 16 and 17. Totally. That share what you said, vulnerability and empathy. That's why it resonates. I love that. I completely, I completely agree with, um, with that, with that theory. I, and I also feel like when I first started going to therapy, there was like this aha moment where I had a therapist that was like, you need to be a parent to yourself because you didn't totally have grounded parents. So I took that and just really dug into that concept. And so for much of my like uh, teenage years and early twenties, I had this voice that was like a kind of a shaming mom that was like, you can't do that. Why? I don't, it doesn't matter because you can't do it. And so I, I almost created these sort of two different warring personalities in my brain that there was some, there was a right way to do something. And then there was the petulant child within me. And at one point it just felt like Bellatrix Lestrange locked in a gate screaming about whiskey or something. Like I just, that's kind of what it felt like. And when I realized that I was like, oh, that person that sort of that whatever petulant child is it's a part of me and I need to I need to grow up and I need to nurture that and not I I am that person so rather than having a sort of absolute dogmatic binary way of thinking that something is good and something is bad it just seeing it as it exists and accepting it as it is. Yeah, but you don't ever want to eliminate her completely, right? No, and that's the thing. That's I, the thing. I, it's part of who you are. Exactly. And so I I want to I want to grow with her. Like I want all of these parts to grow together, not lock this part of me in, in a cage and say that it's bad. I want to understand why there's this why the mania is there or why this these triggers come or these sort of things. Let me give you an alternative thought about that that maybe it makes sense, maybe it doesn't. Because I don't think you should take on the role of mother and give yourself all yeah, of that I agree. discipline. But on the other hand, okay. there is something I think you should do. At least it's worked for me. Because sometimes I think you have to give yourself what you wish you could get from somebody else. Mm, I agree. Because I was 40-something when my father died, and he was a bad alcoholic. And when he died, I had been pretty successful. I'd gone through and graduated number one in my undergraduate class, master's degree class, PhD class, postdoctoral fellowship, chief intern. I got married, had a family, successful in business, responsible in everything, went to college on a football scholarship. I'd achieved a fair amount in my life. I was 40-something when my father died, and not one time in those 40 years did he ever say, I'm proud of you. Not one time ever did I ever hear those words. So I came to the revelation, I'm going to have to give myself what I wish I could get from somebody else. 100%. It's not that you just don't have it. Yeah. You just have to look in the mirror and say, you know what? He might be able to give you that. He can't give you what he doesn't have. Right, exactly. But I can look myself in the mirror and say, you know what? You are a good husband. You are a good father. You're a good provider. You're a good citizen. You're a good this. You're a good that. So you give yourself what you wish you could get from somebody else. Absolutely. And it's not empty. It may be better if you got from somebody else, but it's not empty to acknowledge yourself for that. So I don't think you should be your mother, you know, lecturing yourself, but you can give yourself things you didn't get from her. Right. Like approval and acknowledgement and that you didn't get from your dad who treated you in an exploitive way which causes you to objectify yourself and let men treat you in that way. Mm -hmm. You can give yourself the values that he didn't instill in you. You can give those to yourself. Yeah. So it's not a matter of being your own uh, parent in discipline-wise, but it is in terms of giving yourself the gifts you wish you could have gotten from him. Absolutely. And I think that also creates a bit of humanity for your parents as well, because you can allow 
you can say, okay, they did the best with the faculties they had at the time. And I, I'm going to take ownership and accountability of my journey and my brain and the choices that I make in this life. And this is my, this is my, this is my life, you know, like I, I'm, I'm in charge here. When you write, does it take you a long time to write or does it percolate, 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 and then just come flowing out? Or is it some of each? It's all different. Every, I feel like every, every poem or song has a different incarnation in some way. So how about same love in 2014? It was Grammy (laughs) nominated. How did that come? That came, I wrote that in about two hours. Really? Yeah. (laughs) You pissed me off. (laughs) Hey, hey, it's Donna from Daily Dose of Donna. Every weekday afternoon on the Daily Dose of Donna podcast, I cover all of the reality TV and celeb gossip and breaking news. I'm a former TV casting director. My husband works in reality TV, and I live for the housewives, the sister wives, the southern charmers, and the summer housers. And let's be honest, all of the drama. I'll give you a day's worth of celebrity and reality news weekday afternoons in just under an hour. New episodes of Daily Dose of Donna post weekday afternoons and are now available in video on Spotify. Subscribe to Daily Dose of Donna. That's D-A-N-A on your podcast app. Two hours, right? Yeah. Okay. We're done here. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's like We're kind real of... happy for you. <laughs> it's kind of like being, you know, like in somebody that improvises or or creates stuff. The, the gestation of creating happens so instantly, you know. And so it was just a series of different creations that happened quickly. <laughs> Why did that flow so quickly for you? Did something trigger that? Why did that happen in a couple hours? Well, um, so Macklemore and Ryan Lewis sent me the track. Right. And it, so the track was already made. The, they were just missing the chorus and the, that sort of ending section. <laughs> just the hook. <laughs> just... <laughs> yeah, we got a verse here and there. We just don't have the hook. <laughs> so um, actually, it, it felt really divine. It felt really like, I don't know, it just felt like kind of meant to be um, because two weeks prior I had been asked to write like, um, a specific, like, a uh, singer songwriter song about gay rights. And I sat down to do it and I couldn't write it. It just didn't feel, it just felt really contrived. And I just didn't feel like it, I didn't know how to explicitly say it. I just felt weird saying it. And then, um, like the weekend before the church that I went to asked me to write a worship song for church. And I was like, I can do that. And I sat down to write a worship song and I was like, this feels awful. This doesn't feel like I I have to be inspired. I have to, it has to feel right in my soul or be compelled for some reason. I, I can't, it's very difficult for me to just write something because someone asked me to, um, which I know is probably not a great characteristic for like a professional writer. Um, but, um, when the song fell into my lap and I got that call to do it, I, I just rejoiced. I was so, I was so happy because, um, I got to speak about my perspective as sort of a, a a queer Christian person. And I got to talk about what I actually really cared about, what I believe is the most helpful for the world. And that's, um, empathy through love. That's like, I got to sing this really sweet chorus just about love and about, you know, loving girls, <laughs> you know, like, and, mm-hmm. and I honestly, when we wrote it and we released it, I thought, I thought for sure I was going to be murdered. I was just ready to be, I was ready to, um, to die for it. Cause I just thought there's no way, there's no way this is going to go over well. But then this happened. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So you weren't exactly murdered. <laughs> no. Because it seems to me you're at the Grammys singing this song. <laughs> was that a surprise to you? Yeah, it was a shock. Yeah, I couldn't tell me about it. this night. That was. It was so special. I, I. It was so surreal, and I felt. I just felt like the luckiest person on earth. I still feel like the luckiest person on earth. I can't believe that this is my job, and I remember. Uh, we there we had like four rehearsals for the Grammys, so we were nominated for Song of the Year, and um, I think 
I think uh, Macklemore and Ryan were also nominated for like six or seven other Grammys. So like two months to the Grammys, we um, I got a call that was like, okay, we're going to be performing at the Grammys. And I was like, holy, I was like, this is awesome. This is so cool. And then three weeks later, we got a call that Madonna was joining us for the Grammys. And I was like, what? This is so, it, all it takes to sing at the Grammys is to be a bartender for two years. And that's, <laughs> that's really all you have to take from this. Yeah. But I, so I was really, really emotional during the all, every rehearsal. So we had four rehearsals and I was just crying and crying. I couldn't, I could barely sing. And um, I just was so overwhelmed that this song that I like, you know, wrote in two hours in like this vocal booth was like sung by this whole chorus. And, and, I, and then I was like teaching Madonna how to sing this one phrase and I was like this isn't this doesn't happen like you yeah you may get murdered after this <laughs> no it was, it was like we were trying to figure out how our voices blended and it was just like I couldn't believe that that happened and that it was so close to my story and um, I thought about all of the queer kids that were possibly watching the Grammys, watching all of these couples get married and feel okay and seeing this like, you know, like fat girl on TV, you know, singing about her gay love. Like that doesn't happen. That's not a real thing. Apparently it does. Yeah. <laughs> you said you were crying so much and you couldn't sing, but you peaked at the right time because I, I, I saw the performance. And <laughs> You pulled it all together at the right time, right? Yeah. That red light came on and yeah. so did you. Yeah, <laughs> I had to. Yeah. When the red light comes on, yep. it's all of a sudden... Game time. That was a pretty special night, right? Yeah, it was. You'll never forget that one. No. At one point, like at the dress rehearsal, when I saw the set and everything, and um, I, since I'd been crying all through the rehearsals... I was like, okay, this is the dress rehearsal. Like, I have to pull this together. And they didn't tell me that in the dress rehearsal they were bringing all the couples out that were getting married. And I was like, no way, get out. I'm trying to trying to sing here. So, of course, they come out. And, of course, they start crying. And um, Madonna walks over and she wipes the tears off of my face. And it was this real moment of, like, tenderness. And she was like, why are you crying? <laughs> and then her son, David came on stage too and and he was crying too and he was like eight at the time and she was like why is everyone crying <laughs> and he looks at her and he goes mama it's so beautiful and i just saw something really soften in her face that was so just so lovely and and human and and it just made me feel it made the it made the night feel so much more special because it was it was less it was just it was so not about ego or who all of us were and really about capturing this moment in time that felt pivotal and special and that we got to be a part of that in some way. It felt, it's just, I still, I still pinch myself. I still can't believe it. There's something special about writing words and then seeing them come alive, right? Absolutely. In a performance. Yeah. That's something special. Yeah, it is. I do that in script. I do scripted shows too, and I sometimes write a script and then watch it on TV. Yeah. And it's like, I remember sitting at the desk writing that, and now right. I see this whole cast playing this out, and I go, that weird. Wow. Yeah. That must be a really cool feeling. Yeah, it's like you're talking about. Absolutely. Except not so much. <laughs> it is. Well, but I mean, music and all of that. Explain something to me. Yeah. These are quotes. I would say relentlessly interrogate your reality, relentlessly interrogate cultural norms, interrogate your shaving practice, interrogate wearing high heels, interrogate wearing makeup, interrogate payment structure. What do you mean? Um, I guess I mean like, you know, the, what is that bumper sticker? Question your reality. Mm -hmm. I think I started going through a lot of, uh, changes about five years ago, um, when I, I signed to a record label and I was, um, like being, you know, promoted as a pop artist and, and I embraced it. I wanted it. I want to make me the gay Taylor Swift. I want it. Like I, um, I was on that route and there were certain things I was doing, um, and certain th things I felt bad about, especially I think in relationship to, uh, my body, 
uh, what I wore, um, if I was like shaving my armpits enough, um, like what I, why I, why it was important to wear high heels, um, whether I was getting paid the same as somebody else for something. And I started thinking about just the way that patriarchy is sort of insidious in our institutions and in our systems and in even like our basic connections with people that it's, um, it's so, it's so unspoken sometimes that, um, if, if you're not constantly analyzing, uh, situations or decisions that you're making, or maybe decisions that other people make, you miss opportunities to reflect. You missed opportunities to really live a full, complete life that you otherwise might just kind of be floating around or just kind of doing what is the norm. And I, I think sometimes the norm can be inadvertently harmful. So it's, I, like, I don't have a, I'm not on a record label anymore. I don't have a manager anymore. I just, for me, it just was a structure that didn't make sense, even though it's the way that things are kind of done. But you want to make money, right? Yeah. And I do. I mean, that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't believe, I don't believe that like being ethical or, or challenging those things and, and being financially successful are mutually exclusive. Like, I think you can oh, do it all. Oh, me neither. I yeah. challenge it all the time yeah. and I figure out ways to make more. Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with making money. No, not at all. Yeah. That's kind of the way the world votes mm -hmm. on what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, I'm blessed financially. I don't need to do anything anymore. So it's not about that. That's kind of a keeping score sort of way. Does yeah. the world salute what you're doing? Right. Because they vote with their pocketbook. Right. You know, if they like your art, they like your this, they like your that, they buy your paintings, they buy your whatever. Right. Then that's kind of a way they vote. It tells you whether you're resonating with it or not. Absolutely. Plus, I like to buy <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. No, me, me too. I'm a consumer. And I also do a whole lot of things for no money too. So mm -hmm. I don't feel guilty about it since I do the other also. Yeah, it's a balance. You can balance it out. You said one time when you were talking about your desire to be a Christian and a queer person, and those in some churches, they regard that as being mutually exclusive. Yeah. If you ever ask them to really show you the basis for that exclusion, they have a real hard time cherry-picking Scripture to do that. Yeah. If you ever ask them to really do that. They know it's in Corinthians, and they'll tell you that it's an abomination. And That's the only thing they really have. Yeah. And then I can give you about 175 scriptures that contradict that. Yeah. So it doesn't really stand up. I think there are actually like 15 lines more about the dangers of shellfish. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just like you can't, you can't, you can't, you just can't. Well, I was born and raised a Southern Baptist where the theory was God's going to get you. It's just a matter of when. Yeah. And as soon as I was old enough to make my own choice, I went to a different church mm -hmm. where the God was loving and accepting instead of out to get you. Right. And it was a completely different experience. You said you were confronted by a woman in church when you were 17 that just straight up asked you, how can you be a Christian and be a lesbian? Yeah. And your response was what? How can you be a bitch and still be a Christian? Yeah. <laughs> Riddle me that, yeah. Carol. Just kidding. I don't think her name's Carol. I don't know what her name is, but I hope she's happy. <laughs> and I hope, I hope she watched the Grammys. <laughs> and was watching the Grammys. So jump up her, Carol. What'd she say? Um, I don't. I don't, I'm sure I, she spun around and stormed <laughs> off. I don't know. I mean, I think I'm sure I said that and then was like, also, it's absolutely like fine. Like this is, I believe in a benevolent God and I don't know, a, I don't know what God you believe in. It's really amazing to me how people can be so judgmental and then talk about God loving everyone mm -hmm. in the same breath. It's just astounding to me. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Kind of blows my mind. Doesn't it, though? <laughs> Psychology is kind of the same way it is with the gay community. Psychology and religion are supposed to be 
totally exclusive. I remember at one point, the pastor of the Baptist church, he had said some things to the paper about me having this psychological practice in town. And the paper was doing an interview and asked me what I thought about him and what he had said about psychology in general and me in particular. And I said, well, we have one thing in common. We both think the other is the most dangerous man in town. <laughs> well, there's so much danger in just saying, just pray away, just pray it away. Yeah. And it's not that prayer isn't an extremely valuable resource. And mir- I do believe in miracles. I do believe in prayer. But I think that like prayer is also like enacted by like doing <laughs> It's like doing something as well. There's been a lot going on lately about this. I was asked recently by Stephen Colbert what I thought about President Trump eliminating the word transgender from, I guess, the dictionary or the vocabulary or what you can eliminate the term. Have you been reading about that? Oh, yeah. What do you think about that? Oh, I think it's incredibly harmful and there's no other way to justify it other than it's 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 completely blatantly transphobic. Like it's just it's there's no other way to to say that. It's it's not hurting you. People living their lives as they want to live is not harming you. Why do you want to bar people from living full lives? Cuz it makes you feel weird. Get in touch with your own shit then. Your Good. answer is much better than mine oh, was. Oh, well, I'm, I mean, I'm... I'm no, yours is a much like, more thoughtful answer than mine was. It also just seems so torturous. Like, it just seems like it's, it's, it's intentionally meant to inflict harm. It's intentionally meant to make people scared and to, like, go into crisis mode. And I think and when you're the leader of this country, inflicting that on your... on people that you're supposed to lead is so egregious and so harmful. And I mean, I just, I feel like I've run out of words of, of anger. Like, I don't know how to even encapsulate it. I just want to, it just makes me want to scream. Well, you should write about it. It will just be four minutes of me screaming on top of a D sharp. (laughs) I can go with that. We could put a beatbox behind it or something. <laughs> I could go with that. What else makes you mad? Um, I'm actually really hard to anger. Yeah. Bill, how, about little, huh? how about Bill Cosby? Huh? How about Bill Cosby? Bill Cosby right now, man. How about Brett Kavanaugh? Yeah, f- him too. Okay. <laughs> so other than that, you're pretty chill. I'm, I'm a lovely person. <laughs> yeah. Can we stop putting like perpetrators and so. men's like men that do that in positions of power? When does that stop? When does it end? And when do we when do we start believing women? When does that happen? I want I want to I want the Adam Sandler click like fast forward on this because I can't stand this bullshit anymore. It's so and it's what's like I remember watching I I just vividly that second debate between. Trump and Clinton and how he was hovering over her. And I just, I just sobbed. I sobbed all the way through that. I couldn't believe that that was happening and that that person that behaved in such a psycho manner was elected our president. And, and not only it makes me, it not only makes me scared of that as our this is our institution this is this is what is reflecting like us as people but also there's there's 56 percent of people that agree with that and are comfortable with that and and subscribe to that and i just don't know how to contend with that i don't i i it has been my life's practice to be kind and empathetic and i just am i'm finding it so hard to wrap my head around subscribing to that rhetoric. I don't understand it. But you know, there's a psychological paradox going on here. You think? The more people are beating the drum and getting so outraged about him, he's just feeding off of it. Yeah. You realize he spent less money 
on getting elected president than probably anybody in the history of modern politics because it was all earned media. He didn't buy any ads. Yeah. He didn't have to because he had everybody on the other side so incensed that they talked about him nonstop. And I've talked to political analysts now that are on both sides of the aisle that say he is absolutely unstoppable in re-election. And the primary reason is everybody is so heated in their attacks on him that he's getting all this free publicity and it's running amok that he's unstoppable. I just came up with an idea. All right, let's I'm hear totally, it. you're 100% right. What if we, like, as a people, elected a black trans female as our new president, but not like we didn't hold an election. We just were like, okay, this is our new president. And then that president was always on TV and we never talked about Donald Trump. It would kill him. That would be cool. It would kill him, though. <laughs> I'm serious. If there was a blackout, I remember recently, I forget who it was, but somebody did a blackout. They said for a week, they refused to speak Kim Kardashian's name. <laughs> <laughs> there was a Kim Kardashian blackout. <laughs> they would not speak her name for a week. It was like a hush fell over the land. <laughs> Maybe if everybody just said, we're not going to speak Donald Trump's name for a week, he might just implode. <laughs> he just might go in there and just be orange all over the walls. I mean, who knows? I don't know. But I don't talk politics, and I don't yeah. ever say how I voted. Mm. I don't like either side, to tell you the truth. I think they're all a bunch of crooks. Mm. Some things are just so toxic. Yeah. Like, let's just erase this word from our vocabulary. Are I you agree. kidding me? I agree. Do you have a favorite work in here that stands out above all other? I think so. I th yeah, there's a, there's a poem in there that's um, like explicitly about, uh, it's about my rape. Um, <laughs> I'm like, this is my favorite poem when I love <laughs> to read, just about my rape. It's um, like a concept that I thought of when I was thinking of my, when I was thinking, okay, what if bodies are like poetic? What if they're like, what if bodies are speaking vessels for God? And we're all, we are all, you know, we're all servants, you know, we're all, we're all supposed to be doing good for each other and doing good for the world. And if bodies are, are speaking vessels for God, then what would it look like when one person raped another person? And what would that conversation look like in a poem? And so I wrote that poem. Why don't we finish this conversation with you reading that poem? I would love to. All right, the floor is yours. If bodies are speaking vessels for God, then this is a poetic conversation we had while you raped me. I am a country with hands, and you are a thing with a mouth. Mandy, was it? Sorry. My body is a burning home. Everyone wants out, or they want a redeeming story about the arsonist. They want to hear the interesting parts about Iraq, not the slow pain, only the camaraderie, but my friends are dead, and your hair is soft. When I was young and sad and hungry, I learned how to guillotine a tulip like you with my eyes closed. Why do you look like that, Angel? You asked for this headlessness. Your neck, a white flower waiting for teeth. Face all wide like a teenage girl or a deer I shot once that didn't die right away. Look at me, Canyon Eyes, what's her name? Look at this drunken palace you brought me. Look at the world I do not have, how it does not open to me, how your thighs are closed like a golden challenge I have always deserved, how your June-July calendar hips sang to me in the hall, asked me to choke them into a waltz. I'm here alone, and I need a friend, an arrow, an animal to kill. For fuck's sake, look alive. Chris, my name is God. You will not remember these moments, these death maneuvers, these horror orchids, how the shape of your violent mouth turned into a kiln born inside children that I do not have yet. Watch when you turn my please don't into a knotted snake around my neck. Watch how your teeth puncture my every morning. 
the residual memorial of my body. My please don't sits cross-legged in an underwater arcade slurred, but Chris, know that they hear this please don't in infinite heavens. Could you bring me another year? A different body in the shape of a red tulip field, oh God. This is the part where I laugh because I can't scream to shatter your bed, cannot kill my father, cannot denounce the gift of living or break you, Chris. I can only laugh high-pitched and maniacally curdle inside the coffin of my mind, can only survive. I will remember you for the rest of my life, how everything is glowing white. You will not think of me will give me a different name and story, and I will wear it around my neck like a diamond noose. When I put on my jeans quietly in the morning, Chris, don't mention an animal you killed when you were just a boy. Don't say that it didn't die right away. We will leave it there. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. All right. If you would like to watch the video of this entire interview, please go to Dr. Phil's YouTube channel and subscribe. It's free and you will find this interview and a whole lot more.